Good morning, everyone. Welcome, and I welcome Gail Zarek as our minister this morning. Come, let us worship our God. Please join me in the call to worship. How good it is for us to come together as kindred spirits. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our doubts are answered and we feel the presence of Christ. The risen Christ speaks to us and gives us peace. Hallelujah. Let our worship be the sign of our belief. Dear God, we all rejoice and sing today for your wonderful creation, the triumph of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us as we worship your living name today. Amen. During Lent, I had to confess to myself that I didn't always pay attention as much as I should to the words of confession. So I, during Lent, I tried to um, be, pay a little more attention. So today, let us draw near to God in a spirit of confession with sincerity of heart and full assurance of faith. God of mercy, we come celebrating our unity, but we confess the many ways that we are divided. Our nationality, ethnic origin, economic status, gender, age, and musical preferences all too often obscure the common calling we share in Christ's name. May our common identity as your children and our communal witness to Christ bind us together in your name. Forgive our tendency towards separation and division, and remind us that we are your Easter people. Friends, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, <clears throat> we are forgiven. Speaking of joy, let us participate in this joyful part of our service by passing the peace to each other.
lesson today is from John 20, verses 19 through 31. That's in New Testament, page 115, if you are following along with me. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I'd like to ask the children to come to, to the front of the uh, room here for the children's sermon. <clears throat> do we have any children who would love to come up with me? We're going to do a little bit of an experiment today, and I really, really, really appreciate you coming up. Thank you. So it's just you and me today, and I'm happy that you're here. The sun is shining, and that makes me happy too. Does it, does it ever make you happy to see the sun come out, especially after a rainy day? Yeah, me too. In fact, let's talk about the sun. We're going to do an experiment with the sun. So let me ask you, first of all, what do you know about the sun? Uh, the planets orbit. Ooh, you know a lot about the sun. The planets orbit around it, like the Earth that we're on, right? And it also brings light, doesn't it, and warmth. And when it comes out, we feel good and we feel happy. Sometimes clouds come into the sky and they hide the sun. Do you think the sun is still there even though all we can see are clouds? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just that they're hiding it, right? Yeah. Now what happens when the sun goes down at night? Then it's dark. It gets dark. It gets really dark and it feels different, doesn't it? What do we see in the sky at nighttime when it's dark? The moon. You know, the moon it seems to be about the same size as the sun, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But it's not as bright. Yeah. Do you know why? Uh, it's not fire. It's not fire. Yeah, the sun is on fire. It has great power. But the, the moon doesn't have as much power, right? <laughs> In fact, the sun has so much power that sometimes it reminds me of the power of God, how it shines light and power all over us the way God shines his light and his power over us. But the moon is not as bright. Now, have you ever seen the sun and the moon in the sky together? Yeah. You have? Not usually though, right? Yeah, sometimes you see a little sliver of the moon in the daytime sky, but it's never like the sun. Well, tomorrow, there's going to be a very unusual 
event involving both the sun and the moon. Do you know what that is? An eclipse. Yes, thank you. Well, an eclipse is a very mysterious thing. It doesn't happen very much, very often. And so it's, I thought we would do an experiment today so we could do our own eclipse right in here, okay? All right, I need your help. All right, first of all, you can sit there. And we are going to take out an Earth. This is just a model of the Earth. It's really a ball, right? But it, imagine if the Earth were this big. The moon would be about this big. This isn't really a moon, is it? What is it? It's a golf ball, yeah, but we'll pretend it's a moon, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank goodness for pretending. So we know that the moon goes around the Earth, right? Uh-oh, we need a sun, don't we? We need a sun. Now we know that the sun is a lot bigger than the moon. In fact, if the moon were this big, the sun is so big in comparison, it wouldn't even fit in this room. It's enormous. Well, I couldn't bring a sun into this room that big, so I made a, about the biggest sun I could. And here it is. We're going to hang it up in the sky. Here is our sun, okay? We're going to hang it up, and we're going to do an eclipse. There's the sun in the sky. Tell you what. We'll each have our own moon, okay? You can have this moon, and I'll have this moon. And now I need you to come and stand in front of this line, far away from the sun with me. And if, if we imagine we're a tiny, tiny little person on that earth, and the moon is out in our sky, if you hold this in just the right way in front of that big, big, big sun, it hides it, doesn't it? You just did an eclipse. I say we congratulate James right here. Well done. Thank you so much. Now, will you come and sit down with me once again? And we'll have a quick prayer. Dear God, you have made an amazing creation with the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth. The power and size of your creation is amazing. And we have faith that you are always here for us, just the way the sun is always in the sky for us every day. Sometimes things get in the way of the sun in the sky, things like clouds or even the moon, and they make things dark. We have a hard time believing that the sun is still there, but it is. And sometimes we have a hard time believing you are there because things get in the way of our understanding of your magnificent presence. Please help us to remember that you are always here with us and that your love for us shines always like a bright, shining sun. Amen. <laughs>
Today's message is from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. If you wish, you may follow along using your pew Bible on page 122. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I volunteered to deliver today's sermon, I figured, how hard can this be? I've done this before. Well, I've done it twice. Still, I was fine with preparing a sermon until I opened up a blank page on my laptop to start writing something. That's when it hit me. I didn't know what to say. In search of some inspiration, I decided to look up what the authorities say is the lectionary for today, April 7th. The lectionary provides readings from the Bible that are supposed to be appropriate and timely. Here we are a week after Easter. Surely the lectionary would help. What I found were two lessons that left me confused. They just didn't seem to line up with each other. In one lesson, which Nell read earlier, we have the story of doubting Thomas. Thomas was not present the first time Jesus appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. So Thomas said, I don't believe Jesus came back. I can't believe it until I stick my hand in his side and see for myself. And then we have the other reading from the book of Acts. In that reading, there are no doubters. Everyone is full of grace. And the whole group of people in this passage are believers. What a contrast there was between these believers and Thomas. I was stumped. I looked at that blank page and had no idea of what to put on it. Fortunately, my husband Mark came to the rescue by inviting me to see a movie at the film center here in town. The movie was a documentary about an amazing composer named Ennio Morricone. Some of you may know of him. He was an incredibly prolific composer. He wrote hundreds of film scores for movies and television. You might recognize the theme song from the movie called The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, for example. The song starts with five unforgettable notes, which are fittingly described as a coyote howl. Toward the end of the documentary, Morricone spoke directly to the camera. It felt like he was speaking to me. He said, every time you have to do a new score and you have the blank page in front of you and you have to develop a thought, you think, what shall we put on this blank page? What are we looking for? We don't know yet. Maracone's words helped me understand that I wasn't alone when I stared at a blank page and didn't know where I was going with it. He gave me the courage to try again. I went back to doubting Thomas and began to think of him as a kind of scientist. We know that scientists observe and experiment. They use their senses to detect what is going on in the natural world. Doubting Thomas with his scientist hat on, couldn't accept that Jesus rose again after he died. As a scientist, Thomas wanted to rely on his powers of observation 
before he could make any sense of the resurrection. But then the Gospel of John tells us that Thomas did believe after Jesus came to visit the disciples again. And Christian tradition holds that Thomas became such a strong believer that he traveled far from home to places like India to spread the news of Christ's resurrection. How did Thomas change so much? I was stumped yet again. I turned my, pas my attention to the passage from Acts that I read to you a few minutes ago. This is the passage where a whole group of people were believers and great grace was upon them all. But wait, only a few days previously, these believers were among the many who denied having anything to do with Jesus. There were no believers when Jesus was arrested and tried and crucified. But now they have changed and they are believers of one heart and soul. How did these believers change so much? It suddenly dawned on me. These days after Jesus' resurrection were a time of transformation. Jesus' followers and the others who had not followed him were experiencing something massively different. All those stories and lessons that Jesus had told them while he was wandering around the Holy Land suddenly took on a powerful new meaning to them. Jesus' words had been right in front of them, and yet they didn't understand until now. What had happened was mind-blowing and life-altering. The disciples themselves transformed from being fearful, doubting followers into people with new understanding, a new purpose for being and for acting and for telling the story of what had happened to their preacher, their beloved rabbi. The disciples' transformation was so evident to the people they knew that word began to spread far and wide about Jesus' resurrection. And the word continues to spread even now, 2,000 years later. Transformation, it can be a powerful experience. Transformation can happen when obstacles that have obscured our vision are removed to reveal wondrous truths and opportunities. Once we see these truths, we are forever changed. Have you ever experienced a transformation? Has it changed you and, and the direction you have taken in life's journey? I'd like to share with you a story of a transformation I experienced. It was unexpected, especially because the people who opened my eyes was himself blind. It was my first Appalachia service project home repair mission trip. It didn't start out well. During the long drive to West Virginia, one of the boys in my van decided to yell and yell loudly. As we approached our destination, the scenery began to look foreboding. Houses and trailer homes were broken down. Shop windows were boarded up. We arrived at last in Brenton. The ASP staff told me that my team's assignment for the week was to build a wheelchair ramp for an elderly couple. I had never built a wheelchair ramp before, nor had the other adult on my team. Thank God for Pono Wong, who was also on this trip as a volunteer. He was with a different team. But on Sunday evening, he poured over some scraps of paper with me to sketch out how to design and build a wheelchair ramp. Monday, the kids on my team argued and sniped at each other all day. I could hardly blame them. We spent the day digging holes in the mud for the posts that were going to hold up the ramp that went to the trailer home. 
the homeowners lived on the property in a second trailer that was in pretty bad shape. Brenda, one of the homeowners, came outside. She wanted to move with her husband, Sonny, into the better trailer, the one we were working on, but Sonny had bad knees and was blind, so he couldn't manage stairs well. He stayed inside all the time. But this is why Brenda applied to ASP to ask for the ramp, which would make it possible for her and Sonny to move into the better trailer. Tuesday, we heard terrible news. Brenda and Sonny's son-in-law died. Their only daughter was now a widow with two young children. Could this week get any worse? Wednesday, we saw Brenda again. She told us that if we met Sonny, we shouldn't tell him why we were there. He used to be so independent. It would be terrible for him to learn that he and his wife had to depend on the charity from strangers. I looked at the dirty, sweaty teenagers. They were working hard, but for what? The person for whom they were building the ramp was never even going to know of their efforts. Friday came, the last day of our work week. In the morning, a car pulled up. It was a friend of Brenda and Sonny who was going to take them to their son-in-law's funeral. My team was suddenly electrified. We were going to see Sonny after all. I told the team that if we had a chance to speak to him, we would just tell him we were friends to, who stopped by to give our condolences. They agreed with this plan. A moment later, Sonny hobbled down the rickety steps with Brenda and the friend. They led him to the car and helped him sit down. We walked over. The kids hovered wordlessly nearby. I told Sonny how sorry we were to hear of his loss. He held out his hand and began to speak. I'm going to be okay, he said. There are angels around me. Do you see them? I looked up and saw these kids. The boy who had yelled so much had a beatific look on his face. He looked like an angel in a Botticelli painting. So did the other kids. Were they transformed? Or was my way of looking at them transformed? Yes, I told Sonny. I see them. I see the angels. They're right here with you. Sonny and Brenda drove off. We went back to work. We finished that ramp, built a concrete pad in front of it, went inside the trailer, cleaned it up, made some repairs to make sure that the bathroom light and toilet and, and shower worked. None of these acts had been remotely anticipated until that day. We had been transformed. A blind man helped me to see unruly teenagers became angels. And I guess I was transformed too because I decided to come back to ASP the next year and the next and the next and the next. Transformation. We don't go through it alone. We do it with God's help. God helps us through the people around us. Through them, Obstacles that have obscured our vision can be removed to re reveal wondrous truths and opportunities. This is the great message that God gives us today, the week after Easter. We can learn from the disciples who long ago thought their leader had left them and thought they were going to have to rough it on their own. Jesus' resurrection which we continue to celebrate every Easter, transformed them and transformed the world. At the beginning of this year, our church's leader, our beloved Pastor Debbie, left us for a new career opportunity, and we thought we were going to have to rough it 
on our own. Just after she left us, it was like staring at a blank page. What were we looking for? We didn't know yet. But over the past three months, God has been working through us. We are not just surviving, we are thriving. Last year's beautiful Easter service was evidence of this unexpected transformation. We as a church community are not going through this time of transition alone. God is helping us to transform. He is empowering us to forge a new path forward through our faith in him and through our reliance on each other. The disciples did this. Other believers have done this through the ages. And now we as individuals and as a church community are doing this. Whether you are one of those believers of one heart and soul, or whether you are a doubting Thomas, look around you. What do you see? What I see is God is providing tangible proof of his presence through the words and deeds of the people around us. Are you seeing the transformation as well? I hope so, for it is good. Amen. Dear God, we thank you for the gifts and blessings you have showered upon us. We return gifts to you today to bring them to your house. Guide this church to use these gifts in the furtherance of your ministry and to the glory of God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we offer our prayers and concerns to you today. We ask for your particular blessing upon those who live in darkness or in fear, in danger, sickness, or loneliness. Watch over them and comfort them with your presence. We are reminded today of your awesome power and of the magnitude of your creation. We know that you are more eternal and more powerful than the sun, that your goodness, mercy, and love are more powerful than any evils or obstacles that appear to separate us from you. And yet, like doubting Thomas, we often struggle with our faith. Please remove the obstacles that obscure our vision of your power and glory. Help us to remember that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from your love. We pray together now, saying the words that your Son, our Lord, taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.